welcome to my channel. My name is Danny Cruz and I go by Pinchtune and the FPB community. I sometimes just assume that the people that watch my videos knows who I am, but I'm not going to do that assumption today. So I'm gonna explain a couple of things. First of all, I've been flying FPB for over five years. I saw the likes of Joshua Bardwell when he was starting his channel. People like Charpu, Umagad, all those guys, when they started, I saw the progression. Boris, when he was flying a lot, it's the guy I used to watch, you know, before everybody was doing, anybody else was doing videos, really. So I've had the experience through the years of seeing this hobby progress from the very, very early stages of open pilot back when we were flying NACE 32s before Betaflight even existed, all this stuff. And I have thousands upon thousands of hours of flight time because I fly weekly. Needless to say, I have the experience. I can quite talk about certain topics because I do know about them. I was hesitant about trying the DJI system. Uh, I have often jumped into new tech in this hobby, but you know, I first of all, I'm not sponsored. I buy my own stuff and sometimes I'm like, oh dang, I should probably like cut the spending a little bit here, you know? And when the DJI system came out, I was like, I'm gonna take the approach of waiting and seeing maybe version two. And, but I decided eventually to just jump on board and test this out because I don't think version two of this thing is gonna come out for another year. And I really don't wanna be left behind based on the fact that what I do is often test new stuff, try new things. I build a lot of different quads and I try a lot of different systems. I'm the guy who knows a lot about Betaflight, a lot about KISS, a lot about Flight One. It's because I try it all. So recently I jumped on board and ordered my, myself uh, a set of these during uh it's the holidays right now and i ordered this around black friday when they dropped the price um for the kit that does not include the transmitter just includes the goggles and includes the uh, two air units sorry i'm freezing over here it's pretty cold in fact let me close this jacket up before um so before i start slurring my words what i want to do here really is give you my first impressions Again, I'm not sponsored. I'm not being paid to do this review. Nobody sent me gear. This is 100% personal, how I feel about the system. And really that might change over time because again, I just started using this. But I think it's very important to point out how I'm feeling about the system now before uh, I have a lot more experience on it. I'm gonna try and point out things that I noticed things that I like, things that I don't like, and I'm gonna possibly try and avoid some of the things that uh, a lot of the other reviewers already mentioned, simply just do not be that repetitive. Uh, some of these things are gonna be details, some of the things are gonna be a little bit uh, more in depth. My first impression of the goggles is really that they feel like box goggles. They're heavier, they're bigger. The fit is a lot like a box goggle. When you put them on, you truly feel, it doesn't have the antennas attached, but they really do feel like like you have, you know, a box in front of you. Uh, the fit is actually worse than other box goggles. <laughs> and even though technically this isn't a box goggle, I can't see inside, but I heard there's actually two screens. So essentially it's not like a normal box goggle. And the, uh, the screens move independently. So you have your IPD adjustments here and you know, they move in and out like a regular fat shark goggle in a way. Uh, they're heavier. Uh, I believe that's why they put the strap at the top because they, you need to manage the weight so they don't drop forward on your face and, and they, don't, they don't fit very snugly. I know that, that a lot of people said that before. I'm hoping to start seeing more foams on the market. I already started seeing a few, so I might order something else that might be thicker to cover the light leak. So the light leak is really not that big of an issue because the screens are very bright. So I haven't had an issue where the light leak actually messes with messes with uh, me my viewing experience but what i did notice is that i i want them sealed there's no reason for them to be so open even if they're a little bit open at the bottom i do want this from here all the way around here to just boop, hug my face like a suction cup and these do not do that i don't understand what dj i was thinking in terms of the fit when they made these maybe they figured the, if you make a bigger fill they'll, they'll fit more people people with flat faces and whatnot but yeah, or, um, or maybe they were like, we'll just make new phones during, during the time this is out to make you feel more people. So maybe that's where we're going. I'm not exactly sure. Um, 
But anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on that. The actual, the rest of the goggle itself feels quality. The plastic is nice. I like the button, the button arrangement. I just started using these and I got very used to using the joystick to what the, uh, the back button is, you know, and the record button. So, and then the channel changing button over here. So, you know, you, if you, even if you don't know the system very well, the first time you look at them, you're like, oh, I'm a little lost, but you pick it up just like that. It's really actually very simple to use. The antennas and the whole system are actually RPSMA. Now, let me point out exactly what that is. Um, you know, you guys are used to SMA, which is what most FPB companies run. But back in the day, when TBS, Team Black Sheep, was getting started, they used to do everything in RPSMA. Everybody got pissed off. Because everybody was used to SMA already, even though it seems to me, and don't quote me, Levi told me this, Levi, Leviathan, that RPSMA is actually the global standard. So where SMA come from, I'm not exactly sure, but the point is that when FPB started, some of the companies that have more experience in, in radio, they started doing RPSMA, like TBS, Bosscam, for example. And everybody was already settled on, on SMA, so they didn't want to have any part of it. They just, oh, you know, so eventually even TBS finally caved and changed their stuff to SMA. DJ, on the other hand, I think, again, Levi told me this, that uh, because of FCC regulations or in order to comply with FCC, they had to do the standard and they decided to go RPSMA. Now, a lot of people are confused and think that RPSMA and SMA have inverted polarities, as in the center of one and the outside, one being positive and negative, they're inverted. That's not true. RPSMA and SMA, and SMA they have exactly the same polarity. The only difference is that the one side that screws in is male on SMA, but on RPSMA, it's female. So when you see a plug like that in SMA, that would be the female, but in RPSMA, the center is actually male. That really is the only difference. So when you're gonna hook them up, if you hook up two, two female plugs, they're not gonna connect. So, uh, but in a way, RPSMA is actually smarter. And the reason being is you end up with your male plug on your module and the female plug on your antennas. And guess which one wears out? The female so what happens is these systems do have an amount of rated um what is it oh mating cycles same thing goes for the ipx connectors for the uh, ufls for the uh, mmcx there, there's a certain number of mating cycles so even though sma and rpsma the mating cycle is high that like you can plug them in and on a thousand times i don't even know what the, the, side, the amount is, but when eventually they wear out, it's the female side that wears out. So if you put the female side on the antenna, which is the cheap part, fine, because when eventually it wears out, you replace the antennas. Now, when you put the female part on the module, that wearing out, it's a big problem because it really is a lot more work to repair and replace that plug. So in a way, RPSMA is actually uh, it's smarter. Unfortunately, None of our antennas are RPSMA, so now that's why all these companies are selling kits specifically for DJI because they're RPSMA. They're marketing them, marketing them as DJI specific, but all it really is is just instead of SMA, they're RPSMA. So that's one thing I really wanted to point out. Um, it, on a, it's a downside in a way because you have to get new antennas and you can't use the antennas you currently have. But on the bright side, it, I believe it's actually kind of smart to use RPSMA after all. This trap really reinforces the fact that it feels like a box goggle, but I do like the fact that you can attach a regular strap to it. So next up, I'm probably gonna put the ethics strap on it. It'll look, it'll make it look better. And on top of that, I don't really need this upper uh, thing. It, it is heavier, but it isn't that much heavier. Now that DJI did the update to their firmware to where they stabilized the, um, the analog feed to be very fixed on the latency to 20 milliseconds or so. Um, a lot of people are running these on analog now as well. I'll probably try that as well. I haven't gotten that far, um, but the screens. Okay, so a whole system, the picture is amazing because it's HD, but the screens are not actually as good as the OLEDs on the HDOs or HDO2s or Sky O30s or Orcas for that matter. 
Uh, so when you run them on analog, yes, the picture is not as good because the newer systems for analog, the screens are as the best they can be at the moment. So they make analog be as best as can be. I think the progression in the future for DJI is going to be OLED screens on these guys and also smaller air units. That's me predicting when V2 comes out, maybe next year at some point, that's what it's going to be. I believe it's going to be OLEDs over here and then a smaller uh, DJI uh, air unit over there, which already they're working with Cadex to make a smaller system. And um, so it's likely going to work with other people and they're also going to release a smaller one. And it's also going to be up to 6S compatible, which is something that I think they fell short in the first uh, iteration. So that's something to look forward to. So. Even though I don't believe this is a beta system, they're not actually given out to people for beta. Test, having people test it, I, I believe it's a finished product. It's just the, evol the evolution of this, you can already tell it's gonna get better. Uh, sometimes you buy systems where you're like, I don't even know how they're gonna make this better. I can see how this is gonna be better. Um, is it gonna completely replace analog? No. I mean, I still plan on flying a lot of analog, um, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, the other thing I wanted to point out is the DVR feature on this. Uh, apparently right now with the current firmware, if you fly 4.3, which is what I'm flying, it records in 4.3 and vice versa if you fly 16 by 9. Maybe that's something they'll change in the future. Uh, but DVR, so I plan on running a GoPro on anything anyway. I want my footage to be as best as possible. So I'm not planning on running this DJI S7 recording HD and not carrying a GoPro. I just know, I know, I know somebody's gonna be like, oh, it's DJI, not DJI. Having that HD DVR is really good. Like yesterday, if you look at the video I just posted uh, from our flight the other day this weekend, uh, my buddy Ori went down a second time and then the actual way we found his squad was looking at the DVR multiple times. And it was hard to find a squad, even watching HD footage. So when you are trying to find a quad that's down watching analog it's even harder because the detail is not there so in terms of reviewing footage to find a, a lost quad this is going to be good because you can actually see what's going on and you can tell the detail i think ori finally realized where he was because he saw this blue tarp and details of a, of a house that would have been a lot harder to see in analog you can probably tell i'm starting with the goggles and moving towards the air unit afterwards um the, the goggles come with this wire uh, to power them and it goes into an XT60. I'm running a 3S battery right now, but I believe the goggles also do up to 4S. I don't know the full system yet, so I'm being careful. I know the air unit does up to 4S. I'm actually running a regulator so I can run 5S and the goggles, they might take 4S. I don't even know yet. I'm running them on 3S because that's what I use to run my crossfire and when I'm doing analog to run my clear view, so might as well, I'm running this, that same thing. I am used to having a little cable anyway that goes up to me because I've run clear view for the longest time. So I have a wire that goes up to my uh, goggles. So this doesn't feel alien at all to me, but the nice thing is you can run a battery on the strap if you put like a regular goggle strap on these. So for anybody that doesn't want to have any cables dangling around, that is definitely an option for you as well. Okay, let's start with the actual picture and a couple of things I noticed. I've been flying an Impulse RC Apex HD, which is the first quad I built for the DJI system. It's running the newbie drone Infinity Stack. I am normally uh, either a Kiss or a Flight One guy. Uh, I prefer how it flies, but I didn't. I, I didn't want. I just wanted to build something quickly. I know the Infinity system is well proven and it has an onboard regulator that can provide enough headroom to work the system because as you guys know, the ideal voltage for it is actually, for the air unit is uh, is um, nine volts. You can plug up to 4S, but the point is that most guys that are running regulators, they run nine volts on it. As you know, most regulators, when they get warm, they don't provide the rated amperage. So the newbie no system that's up to 18, 18 uh, uh, watts. Yeah, check out the other video I have. I'll put the link in the description that is specifically about the new video Infinity Stack. Point is that you want a regulator that can provide enough amperage at nine volts. And if they, if you, if it doesn't, you end up browning out because when the regulator gets warm and whatnot, it actually reduces output. It doesn't normally output what it's supposedly rated to. 
which is sad. So you, uh, the, the Ad Infinity system does provide enough. Uh, uh, some of the guys are using the uh, Maytech reg 9 volt regulators and those small like buck regulators, uh, I know they've gotten brownouts a lot of them. So they, they will run, um, run in parallel sometimes to provide enough amperage. So the point is that you want to have that headroom and for that, there's a number of companies that have been making FCs that have the right regulator to run this system. So eventually when DJI makes it so that it's compatible with 6S, that's all going to go away. At the moment, you can run an external regulator. That's what I used to do, do back in the day anyway. I we used to run regulators for everything, for the camera, for the, um, for the FC. So running an external regulator is an option. And I built this quad, let me show you. So here's the Impulse RC Apex that I built for DJI. I think it's a very smart design. Um, I, I I normally like to have at least a couple of Impulse RC builds in my fleet. I normally fly Hyperlows, some of these, and I fly for racing FPV Flight Club. And, but I think this frame is a very smart design. It's just, they, they really made a good amount of space to fit that air unit very well in the back where the antennas attach. It is not necessarily perfect. I think the gap between the MMCX connectors and these uh, standoffs is a little too small. So I actually had to grind them down a little bit so they would fit. Uh, I might end up putting a TPU mount for them here and that will require an MMCX to RPSMA connector and then the antenna um, on, uh, over on top of that, which is what I'm probably going to end up doing simply because I don't actually kind of like how those look. They wanted to stick back a little bit more. But regardless, I, I like how, how this frame came out. I am having a little bit of a problem with the tuning. I am I have a very, very specific way I like my quads to fly. I, like I said, I've been flying for a long time, tuning a lot of quads, and there's a reason I like Flight 1 and KISS is because I fly a certain way. And I've been flying 357 for beta flight on some builds for a long time, and now I just installed 4.1, and I can't get the tune quite right. So here we go into why that's important. The main thing is, how is this system going to enhance the way I fly or hinder the way I fly, even if I can see better. That's what you need to know. And here we go. There are basically two, type of, two types of pilots. There's the pilot that flies for himself and the pilot that flies for the GoPro. I will repeat that. There's two types of pilots. Pilots that fly for the GoPro and pilots that fly for themselves. All the guys that fly micros that don't carry GoPros and some of the ones that even carry GoPros but fly for the experience, those are the pilots that fly for themselves. This DJI system is for you because it'll make your flying just so much more fun because you can see so much more. And a tiny bit of added latency is not gonna mess you up. So the latency I've noticed that kind of like hovers between 22 to 25, 26 uh, uh, micro, um, milliseconds. And that is about 10 milliseconds higher than my fastest system, which is a total of about 15 milliseconds. Is it bothering me? No. Uh, would a faster system be better? Probably. But the point is that if you're flying for yourself, I think you're really gonna enjoy this. Now, I'm the guy who kind of flies for the GoPro because I fly for how that video is gonna look in the end. Most of the pro pilots, that's what they do. I know, I'm not gonna mention any name, names. The point is that if you fly for the GoPro, then that is where a question comes up. And that's the question that I currently have. Is this going to make my flying for the GoPro better or worse? I don't know yet. I'm still learning the system. Um, and I think in a way it will improve my flying. It'll make my flying different. So as far as I know, for now, I'll be flying both analog because I know I can fly to the GoPro for the GoPro like I want it to be. But as I get better with the system, I think it might actually improve my flying for the GoPro. And that's because I can hit certain gaps that I'm kind of afraid to hit when I am flying analog because I cannot see. However, I'm not really gonna know that until I get this guy flying right. Because right now, my Hyperlow RS Plus Flying Flight 1 is my best flying quad. 
My second best flying quad would be my Impulse RC Reverb with KISS V2. And uh, yeah, I do highly recommend this stack, especially if you're a Betaflight guy, because you're really gonna like it. But because I'm not necessarily a Betaflight guy, I'm having trouble getting this set up to the way I want it to be. So I'm gonna give it a couple more days to tune this quad to how I want it to fly, mainly because I never liked the robotic feel of uh, Betaflight. And once I get it to fly like I want it to fly, I'll be able to know more in depth whether or not this system is actually gonna make my flying better. Keep watching my videos because there is more coming as far as how I feel about the system in terms of is it going to improve my flying or be just as good. Uh, hit like in the meantime before we get there and uh, also subscribe if you haven't yet because there's a lot more comment, uh, content coming. Even if you don't like the AI, even if you don't like the idea of the system, I don't feel it's going to mess with our rest of FPV. I really don't think it is. So you might be interested in finding out more about what I have to say about it. So subscribe, help me out. Okay, uh, let's move on to a couple more things I wanna talk about before I close this video. And that is specifically the picture. Now, depending on where you fly, the footage can look like you're flying through a GoPro. It's pretty amazing. I am flying in 4.3, mainly because I'm so used to flying 4.3 that I immediately switched it to 4.3 because I wanted it to look like the same aspect ratio that I fly at. Also, you have the, the lens on this is slightly narrower than a 1.8 and 2.1 that I normally fly. And I believe um, the system actually is 4.3 priority for some reason, which is odd for an HD system. And what I mean by that is an H, uh, an, uh, where there's an aspect priority. If 4.3 is the aspect priority, what it does is chop the top, yeah, the top and bottom of a, s I'm confused now. Oh yeah, yeah, it chops the top and bottom of a 4.3 image to make it 16 by nine. If it's 16 by nine priority, it chops off the sides to make it 4.3. And whenever you chop something off, you crop it, you lose some image. So given that it's 4.3 priority to make it 60 by nine, chopping the top and bottom off, you lose some of the vertical field of view. So in my opinion, 4.3 is better on this one because you get all of the image that the thing has to see. Uh, if I'm wrong, let me know in the comments because I'm pretty sure this is right because I, I tested it yesterday a couple of times and I switched back and forth a couple of times and I noticed this. But hopefully I'm not wrong and not looking stupid right now. So let me know what you think. Okay, uh, but here's the thing. When you're flying in an open field with a couple of trees here and there, the image is perfect. However, I live in a forest and I noticed that when it's all foliage, it's not as perfect. And here's the thing. A lot of you guys are not going to understand this. You have to be like a photographer and work with imaging and video all the time. But let me just put it this way. I, I, I shoot photography as part of my professional life. If I shoot a picture with certain camera settings and I have an open sky and I have some trees and I save that picture as a JPEG, let's just say that picture is 300K, 300 KB, kilobytes, right? If I take the same camera with the exact same settings and I shoot a picture of an open field with a couple of trees and a lot of sky, same exact camera settings, guess what? That picture is gonna be lighter. Let's just say it's gonna be 150 kilobytes. Same settings, but there is less detail in the image that the camera needs to show, that the picture needs to show. So there is a lot less information to pipe through. That's what's happening here. I noticed that flying inside the forest here, the system doesn't lag. So the system does a very good job at keeping the bit rate pretty steady at about 25 Mbps. And then it also does a good job at keeping the latency pretty good around a little over 20. But in order to do that, it has to compress the image some more. So I've noticed in a deep forest like this, I get a lot more pixelation and the image looks a lot more compressed. And that, to me, the theory is that it has to pipe down through the system so much information, so much more information than if, if it were in an open field. That's something that I noticed. I was a little bit disappointed about that, but the picture is still way better than analog. And I was flying through areas with scraggle and whatnot that I would normally not try with analog. So that is uh, kind of one downside of the system, but it's only physics, I guess, in a way, because it needs to pipe down so much information. However, then I flew it yesterday in an open field with a couple trees here and there, which is the video that I posted yesterday. 
I mean, I didn't fly there. I flew it. Point is that I flew it yesterday on another field, <laughs> with uh, with and and it was it was a lot more impressive. So yeah, it looks like it's dependent on how much information it has to pipe down. So those are the things I have noticed so far. Um, so far, it's all pluses. It isn't perfect. I think the o this should have OLEDs. The fit of the goggles should be better. Maybe they could be a little bit smaller. Uh, definitely the air units will be smaller and should support up to 6S. I think in a year, none of us are gonna have to be dealing with the fact that we gotta run regulators for the system. I think the system is gonna get smaller so it can fit in uh, more frames, not necessarily frames specific for the DJI air unit. I don't necessarily see it for micros yet. I think it's a long way before it gets down that small, but four inch, I know there's guys running three inch with it. So if it gets small enough to be like 20 by 20 or even a regular real 30 by 30, then it will fit on three inch frames more, a more common three inch frames at least. Um, but yeah, uh, at, that's what the point I am right now. This is all honest. I really wanted to do this review because there's a lot of people talking about this system out there. And I am skeptical of everybody and I don't know who's kind of like selling it because they, they're they sponsored. I mean, I've, I really liked uh, Ferrati's videos um, because he he bought it himself. He's super stoked. He got stoked on, on the system of flying again, really because of it. And I know that he's honest and he's not doing this because he's sponsored or anything like that. He just bought it and loves it. Me, I am still at the stage where I'm experimenting. I am kind of tippy-toeing, make sure, making sure that I, um, how I feel about it. And so, yeah, uh, subscribe. There's more like this coming. I, um, at some point I know I'll have like a bird, excuse me. I know at some point I'll have an actual verdict of, uh, whether I love it or not. But my prediction right now is that I'm not going to switch completely from analog. I'll be flying both. Uh, I just have some analog quads that just fly so amazing that I don't want to touch them. And until further notice, I, I'm not gonna switch over. So I'll keep experimenting and flying them back and forth. Um, yeah, keep in mind that the system does interfere with analog, not in that you can't fly them together, more in that you gotta make sure the channels actually match. If you're four on this and four on analog, you're gonna knock somebody out of the sky. And yeah, uh, I think that's it. So again, thumbs up, thank you, subscribe. I will see you when I have more about this topic. We'll talk soon, all right? I don't wanna leave this video without showing you this. So one thing I do notice is, as far as like finished product goes, it doesn't get more finished product than this. Like for me, the experience of quality products and unboxings is very important. And I, everybody knows, even if you're an Apple hater, you know that Apple knows it when it comes to experience and the finished product and the presentation and dji is a much newer company than apple but they're obviously following in apple shoes because the stuff looks very apple ish the air unit comes packed in a very apple ish package it has some booklets inside for quick start guides and there's the the air unit it looks bright doesn't it probably make this a little bit less bright come on yeah okay hold on there we go that's better um and yeah i mean it's a it's a very nice piece of aluminum here and even though it's big there's no question that it's a, a very very good looking product and it doesn't get more finished than this now will there be more um technological advancements for this system in the future of course but for what we have right now this is quality stuff